All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is September 18th, 2022. And obviously, we're still here. We can't say nothing's changed. The world has gotten crazier. We've seen what's going on with events over in the Middle East and with Russia. We, we can see it. It's building. But uh, that specific time everybody's looking for, right? So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to spend some time in Scripture in some key places, you know, in places that for those who haven't been around for a while will see these connections that we've made in different areas over the years. If you've been around for a while, you will have seen them, but we're going to put them together in this kind of package here today that will clearly tell us this season and time that is literally at the end. I mean, in the season of the year, of the time of year that this can take place, we're, it, it should be at a point where we would be saying, well, it's, it's already over, but it's not. And we've spoken a little bit over the last few videos, especially the last one, and I'm going to reiterate that final piece that we could be looking at, that final portion that ties all of these together to take us to this final piece. Now, I can already hear some people out there. I know there's two camps out there, all right? There's one camp that says, forget about specific date watching. You know, let's just always be ready, always be watching. Searching them in the scriptures. We've, you, there's such great teachings here. There's so much revelation. There's so much depth that we get into. Let's just focus on keep doing that. Well, I agree. And for them, that's what works. I agree with that. But it doesn't mean that people who also do those things and also like to have something to look forward to, that that's not right for them. You see, why can't it be both? And I think it can. Because we've proven that here in this ministry. We've got seven years of teachings that prove we don't just focus on the date, the date, the date. We don't go from event to event to event saying this week, that week, this week. Have we been doing it recently? Yes, but with reasoning. Absolutely with reasoning. And we're going to touch on that towards the end here today as well. We've talked on it a fair bit lately, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But there's reason to it. And it's because we know the time frame of the pre-trib, the time frame of the mid-trib, and the time frame of the post-trib. It is revealed in Scripture. We know that they're all true. We know the time frame over which it will take place, which is 50 days and 14 years, which we're going to touch on today to prove it out again for those that maybe haven't been around for a little bit or have only been around for a little bit. And you see... The scriptures, knowing what the scriptures tell us, having been able to reveal it and understand it, there's a reason. There's a reason why this year, at this in this season, that ends at the end of the weekend. That ends on Sunday. There's a reason why we're still diligent in it. Because we know that the pre-trib is connected is going to be at the true feast of weeks to the Lord God. That is where it's going to happen. The mid-trib, the it'll take place, the events will start to culminate at the end of six years of seals. It'll be at the time of the fall feasts, at the true Lord God's fall feast times. But the great multitude will take about six or seven months before the great multitude rapture happens because it's connected to unleavened bread. It's connected to the time of Passover, either first or most likely second Passover. And the post is connected to tabernacles. So when the Lord returns feet down, it will be at the time of true tabernacles. It's the representation of all three of the feasts of the Lord. And even though it looks like 7-1-7, the end starts with the middle, which is the Feast of Weeks, and then seven years of seals for unleavened bread, seven years of trumpets for tabernacles. We know this. This is why we're still diligent. And there's other reasons, of course, with the sun, the moon, and the stars as to why we remain diligent even today in the midst of September. We're a little past the middle of September, and we're still looking for the, for the Lord God's true feast of weeks. 
give me a break. Shouldn't it be done already? Well, if you listen to the Jews who are, who err, if you listen to the church, the church who errs, yeah, it, it absolutely would be done according to their count. But when you understand the harvests, when you understand that there's two wheat harvests, when, when you've studied out these things, you understand that the beginning was Taurus, that the Lord revealed through his spirit, Taurus is the beginning, that not only Taurus is the beginning, but at the time of the escape, we have to also be connected to Virgo. You see, none of those things are going to happen as they do this year for another 30 years. Well, obviously, we're not waiting another 30 years. This is why the diligence and still spending time trying to pinpoint a specific time frame or a specific day or within a two-day period. It's not because, oh, we want to be first. We want to be the ones that got it. I don't care. It's the revelation that we've been given. It's the revelation of seven years that we're, that, that little cherry on the top that we want to finish it off with. That's why we're diligent on it. So for those who, who don't like looking to specific dates, then watch other teachings that we have. There's so many teachings, hundreds of teachings here that you can go in, study them, read, watch them again, and spend time digging deeper into those things because you can go deeper and deeper and deeper and find more and more and more once you have the keys. So you can go and do that. But there's also the group that I also like, which is we are looking for a specific time frame because the scriptures revealed it. It has to end after 70. And before that 70 is fully over, there's a 50-day period that comes first. And we're going to share the evidence, the proof from scripture of that again here as well. So with that, hold on tight. We're going to spend some time in here today. And I'm going to, I'm going to put up another what I believe. And in fact, it's not that it wasn't shared already. It's that now it's the final piece. I mean, I should say that the final option. I don't have anything after this. Um, does it mean it can't happen later in September or in October? I mean, I guess so. But I don't know. I would have no idea how to explain it in relation to it being connected to the Feast of Weeks. But this final piece coming this weekend, we know we can. In all of these videos here, the last five videos, lay it out. And tonight, we're going to just put that final piece of the picture into the mix and show where I believe the final option for this year is. But please listen. It doesn't mean that it can't be later in September. It doesn't mean that it can't be in October. And there's just something we didn't yet understand about the Feast of Weeks and when it's observed. I, you know, I, I, I find that hard to believe that it could be in October or going to November or some crazy stuff like that. But you're not going to hear me talking about it. Well, okay, now we got this date over here. Now we got this date over there. It's going to go back to teaching. And then eventually, later in the month into October, we'll start to change things up. Um, we'll reestablish some things. We'll go back to the Gospels. We'll go back to the years. We'll do full out teachings. We're going to break each teaching down and, and maybe even uh, take this thing on the road. So, you know, we, we, there has to be a plan. But, you know, I was talking with our brother Mark and Neil uh, yesterday. I think it was yesterday. And, um, you know, Neil's like, no, nah, you're not going to have to do it. <laughs> you're not going to have to take this thing on the road and, and, and do those other portions. And I, I, I'm, I'm so hopeful. And, and I agree because I don't know what we would do with 70 anymore. Where would 70 be connected to? I, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, what could we do with it? I, I, I don't understand. You see, there is no more connection after this time frame. There's no more connection to 70 after this, this year, this, this roundabout time frame that we're in. We've showed the count from Scripture. So we'd be left scratching our heads. And what would happen is, just to give you guys a heads up, that would have to just come off the table. I wouldn't have any more explanation 
to be able to say, okay, well, 70 years is because of this, and this is how we'll do that. You know, the Lord never leaves us hanging. But maybe it's for something else at some other time frame we don't know. But I, you see, I find that very hard to believe. And the reason I find it hard to believe is because we're the only ones that have been led in the persistent, diligent seeking and searching of the understanding of the 70th year. And this is the end of it, according to Scripture. So I believe there was a purpose. I believe there was a reason. And it's one of my number one reasons why we're remaining diligent this year on determining and understanding where the Lord God's true Feast of Weeks is as it was in the beginning. And so we're going to touch on that today as well. If you're new to the ministry or you're newer and you haven't yet gone to ministryrevealed.com, you can come to the website by clicking on it right there. You can come to the menu box right here. Click on intro. And when you click on intro, you'll see the first four videos. I believe there's maybe 10 or 12 uh, videos in here. The first four videos are key. The first one's 22 minutes. And it introduces what you're going to begin to understand in the next three. This one is a 30-minute intro, who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to see the revelation that Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end of days is Luke, Mark, Matthew. The first will be last. The last will be first. Luke is pre-trib. Mark is mid-trib. Matthew's post-trib. And you're going to see that it's all because of these differences that are in the Gospels that everybody thought, well, it was just perspective. We can prove it's not just perspective. It's all about prophecy. It will blow your mind and you will begin to understand and read scripture in, in, in a way and in a level as you never have before. It's just a 30-minute intro into it. <clears throat> the third video is the years of tribulation. Once you understand this within the Gospels, you're going to realize that the end of days is not seven years. You see, everybody that teaches on seven years teaches you from Matthew because they didn't know who Mark was speaking to in its time frame. They didn't know who Luke's was speaking to in its time frame. Luke's is a period of time called 50 days, which is a period above the 14 years. Like 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years. That word above is 50 days. That's what it represents. And then that one goes to the third heaven. And then... You have a mid-trip that goes to paradise, and then it says, in the third time, he's now coming to them. A taking, a taking, and a return. You're going to see that pre, mid, and post are all true, but because everybody has gone from the Gospel of Matthew to try to relate the revelation of the end of days, they've missed half of the tribulation, which is the seven years of seals that affects and is for the whole world before the seven years of trumpets, which is Matthew's portion. You see? so. It's really, really going to blow your mind. And a lot of people, <laughs> I get messages like this all the time. Oh, my goodness, seven years was long enough. Now you're telling me it's going to be 14. Oh, no. Well, what does it matter to you? <laughs> you know, if you're in Christ, diligently seeking him, watching and praying, loving and repentant, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's 50 years long. Who cares? You see, the length is actually better for those in it. For more will come to be saved in their portion. But how did all of this get missed? Well, this is the big video. The fourth one in the intro series, it's all because of Matthew. And just like the title says, it's all because of Matthew. We've all been taught for hundreds of years in, in seminaries, in, in Bible colleges, all over the place. We've all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. And we look only to Mark for a little bit of filling in the blanks and Luke for even a little bit of less of maybe filling in blanks, not realizing that they actually stand on their own for their portions and who they're speaking to. And so the whole time we've been shown the seven years of Matthew of the, the house of Judah. That's why they say the seven years are for Jacob's trouble. They're for the Jews. And they think everybody's going pre-trib. No, nope, that's because you're at the end of seals and you're only seeing the seven years of trumpets. And at the end of seals is the great multitude rapture, the mid-trip. Unfortunately, nobody's understood or few have been able to understand. Well, actually, nobody's understood that it's actually 14 years and the 50 days that come first. Luke's discourse, Mark's discourse, Matthew's discourse. 
It's absolutely mind-blowing. So <clears throat> you can go to Ministry Revealed right there to do it, or you can come to this playlist right here from YouTube and click on this intro and watch the first four videos. Also, from the website or from dis uh, links in the description, in the description box below, you can also support the ministry. We're always, always, always um, uh, supporting over in Uganda. Uh, Uganda has had incredible missions. These guys are going out every weekend and during the week. They're doing church service in the church that they built there now. I think they're out there three days a week. They're, they've got people that they've taken in into their home now, uh, homeless kids and people that were in abusive situations. Um, so, you know, the, the help and the need and the support for all of that in the ministry, it, it never stops. All right. It's, it's always, always, always a need. And a lot of people think just because it's Uganda, maybe it won't, uh, it won't, the, the need of funds isn't as great because of the conversion of the dollar. I tell you, it makes no difference. The more that we can send them, the more they can reach, the more Bibles are purchased, the more books are printed, the more, uh, um, testimonies are printed and shared they have reached hundreds of thousands of people in the last year and a half since we've been with them crazy right it's part of the testimony of the ministry in it for each and every one of you as well so keep up the prayers keep up the support if if you can and uh we will continue to finish this strong just like tonight we're gonna keep pushing we're gonna keep going to the scriptures and like i said before I'm not quitting. <laughs> this this is what I will be doing for the rest of my life. Whether it ends this weekend and we prayerfully get to go in the pre-trib to the lowest room of the third heaven, or whether we're chosen to remain and work and serve him, whether that means sacrificially falling to the ground uh, to bring in more, or whether it means we endure till the end for his service, that's what I'll do. So just so you guys are aware, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, it's an emotional roller coaster ride. It's it's stressful, it's heavy, but it's worth it. It'll always be worth it. He is worth everything. It it doesn't matter what it is. We can endure it. All right? So with that, my sip of coffee and Let's get into this. So here's here's a little bit of, uh, you know, all of you guys have been hearing about this in the news, I'm sure. You know, we see that uh, Ukraine with a drone just dropped uh, some sort of missile on a facility, uh, an explosives facility in Russian territory. Now, for those of you who hadn't been paying attention, Russia had just put out a, a, a warning that if something like this happens, they obviously will have been aided by the West and by the UN and all of them, and that this will bring about war. Now, is this really that much more of a big deal for us? Uh, not really so much. It's not like the whole world hasn't already seen this coming, or at least those who are paying attention. It's another massive step. It was a massive, massive explosion. In fact, it was so big, they said it was, it, uh, the, the, the earthquake reporters uh, said it was registered as an earthquake because this was such a huge, a huge explosion. That's pretty crazy. If you think this is going to go unanswered, um, you haven't been paying attention. This isn't going away, guys. That's kind of the point in all of this, right? The, the point isn't, hey, this is all going to settle down. It's all going to go away. The end isn't really about to begin. No, this isn't going away. This will continue until the end comes and then everything goes up in smoke. Okay? It's not going away. Same with this. Oops. I just deleted the other one. The other one I was going to show was, of course, what we saw happening with, um, with uh, 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 the, the pagers, right? Some of the, the walkie-talkies and all those things that, that exploded. I mean, you want to talk about some sort of technical move that that uh, Israel did, oh my goodness. Imagine something like that happening. So again, that was a major, major move. Devastating to Hezbollah. Well, do you think all of this is just gonna go away? There's still, what, a couple hundred prisoners maybe, maybe more? Are we supposed to believe, oh, this is just gonna go away. They're gonna settle it. Uh, uh, the, the Gaza is almost, is almost destroyed. 
They've got a section where they're keeping them in tents and everything else. I mean, it, it, this is just going to go away. And everything will settle in a peace deal. No. This is going to continue until the end begins and then everything goes up. That's what's coming. So I wanted to start with that to remind you guys, especially those that aren't in the forum. So when some of you guys hear me talk about things, you'll hear me saying, you know, in the forum and so forth. At ministryrevealed.com on the uh, on the menu, you can go to intro. Uh, sorry, you can go to forum and you can join us in there. There's about uh, 1,200, close 1,300 people from around the world, and uh, you know they're sharing on prayer requests and and Bible studies and news and all sorts of things going on. And it's like-minded brothers and sisters watching, praying, diligently seeking the Lord from all over the world. And a lot of these posts are put in there and shared on these things as well. And so um, if you want to join like-minded brothers and sisters, you know, you're, you're patient. You have to understand people have different views, right? There are different views. So we can't have this battleground because one person sees like this and one person sees like that. We're able to have discussions about it. All right, but you can come and join us. Come take part in these things and uh, just keep watching, seeking and searching on these things together. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to share that, because, you know, within the forum, we the, the group of people that are in there are seeing these things, the, these news, these articles, these things are being shared on a regular basis. So they're very in tune. But I don't know that everybody else listening is too aware or following too much on these things. And the reason I wanted to share is so that people can understand this is really continuously escalating. It, it It's all part of the signs of the end. This isn't going away. And I just wanted to reiterate that so you guys can understand we are really here. And it's another reason to build on top of coming to the end of 70 that we will persistently pursue this season and time that we're in. Because there's nothing that shows us in the revelation in the seven years of all of these mysteries that we've been revealed that shows anything pushing it out further. So we're being diligent, making sure all the bases and everything are covered. And what's a great place to go and seek understanding in connections to a pre-trib Gentile bride there's nowhere better, of course, than our dear sister Ruth, right? Ruth is a key place. And so uh, over the last, uh, well, a couple days ago, I started going into the book of Ruth and just picking out a couple little things in there and seeing where I would go and just see where it leads because that's how the Spirit has always led me. I don't know where I'm going. Uh, when new revelation comes, I just start and I start reading, I start seeking, I start searching, and more stuff comes. Now, in today's, it's not so much about new stuff coming as it is, oh, there's a, there is a tidbit of things that, that proves another connection that we've known about, but that really proves it out. But this is just to show this season and time and the connection to it that we're in right now. So as I went into the book of Ruth, obviously starting in Ruth chapter 1, this was this right off the bat stood out to me. And those of you who have been around for a while know exactly what it is. In, the Ruth, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Okay? And it goes into the story of Ruth. Well, this is a fun one for us, isn't it? Because the days of the judges, if you go to your Bibles, of course, judges is right before Ruth, and judges has 21 chapters. Well, we have the revelation of the 21 chapters of the book of Judges. The book of Judges has in what we call this, this chart that we have, which you can find in the links in the description box under the videos, is what we call the chapters to years. And within it, there's 14 chapters in Hosea, 14 chapters in Zechariah. This is to the Gentiles or the house of Israel. This is to the Jews. And they're the only two by, uh, the only two, um, uh, uh, chapters in the Bible that have, or the only two books in the Bible that have 14 chapters. And one is written to the Gentile and one is written to the Jew. 
and the end of days is 14 years. When I when this was discovered, when I discovered this back in 2018 around April, I, I was freaking out because it was so detailed and Judah is so crystal clear. It's unbelievable. Then you've got the book of John, 21 chapters. You guessed it, 21 years. And it covers it. The, there's so many things. And I don't want to go into the whole story of this. But within these chapters are prophetic insights to things in the end of days. And within the chapters are within the years that these events will take place. <coughs> Excuse me. John in 1 through 21 is connected to Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 21. But Judges is the only Old Testament book that also only has 21 chapters. But its count actually goes in reverse. It's pretty wild. So let me show you what I mean. And this is why I'm saying when it comes to the book of Judges, to see that, to see that Ruth is there and connected with it, when you understand the book of Judges and the portion of its time, we know that in the chapters to years, that within the chapter 15, we're in this period that we're looking for right here when the 50 days would begin. And we know it's going to begin with the taking of the Gentile bride. We know that the Gentile bride is the Ruth type, is the Leah type is related to being the older before the younger, and that's the story of wheat. Winter wheat compared to spring wheat means old wheat compared to new wheat. We've understood these things. We've broken down. We've revealed them over the years. And look at what Judges chapter 15, verse 1 and 2 says. And it came to pass within a while after in the time of the wheat harvest. That Samson visited his, visited his wife with a kid, which somebody showed, showed me this a while back. It's not like she has a little kid with her. She has a little, like a child. She has a kid, which is a baby goat. <laughs> so uh, with, uh, uh, visited his wife with kid, and he said, I will go into my wife. Okay? So he's coming at the time of weed harvest to go into his wife, into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, Verily, I verily thought that thou had utterly hated her. For those that have been around for a while, you know this story type. This, he wants to go in unto his wife, who, who he's now served for. We know it's the time of the wheat harvest, which has to do with winter wheat. We know that the typology of hating her is because it's the same picture as a Leah and a Rachel. They want the, the more beautiful and younger one, not the older and, and more, uh, uh, what they say, gentle in the eyes or whatever they want to say, right? Like, just not as pretty and beautiful as the younger one, right? And this is what we're seeing right here. The same type of story as Leah and Rachel. And listen to what it says. So I utterly thought, I thought thou had utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger? Sister, fairer than she, take her, I pray thee, instead of her. This is a picture of Leah and a picture of Rachel yet again. He has come to Leah, the older one, and he's ready to go into his wife at the time of the weed harvest. You see, it's the same type of story being told. Now watch what happens. We'll bring this back into Ruth and we'll go to Ruth chapter 2. And in Ruth chapter 2, she comes with her mother-in-law. And when they come, it's at the time of the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay? And she goes in with the reapers, and she's there to, to, uh, um, to glean and to gather among the reapers. Uh, sorry, after the reapers among the sheaves. And listen to what it says. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 7. Now remember, Ruth is a picture of the pre-trib Gentile bride. The pre-trib is connected to Leah. The pre-trib is connected to the story in Samson. It's connected to uh, uh, winter wheat, the wheat harvest. It's connected to the Feast of Weeks. And listen to what it says. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather 
after the reapers among the sheaves. Okay? Look at this word for gather. Many of you guys will remember it. To gather for any purpose, to receive, to take away, to remove, to re-reward. This is something we've shared a number of times over the years. Look at this word. This word, in fact, this word gather, you know what? Yeah, let me, this word gather, let me show you, is it's used many times in scripture. And look at what it means, just as we were showing, to gather, to collect, um, to gather for harvest, right? To regard, to uh, reward, gather, gather to oneself. And wouldn't you know it? It's used in Genesis chapter 29 in the story of Leah and Rachel. But you might think, well, what, what, who cares about the word gather? Well, let me show you what the difference is between pre-trib and mid-trib. Pre-trib and mid-trib, the answer is right here. If we go to, let's go to the Hebrew number, which is 717, okay? The Hebrew number, 717. What is 717? This is what we were talking about in the beginning. There are three feasts of the Lord. That, that they're to appear before the Lord, not be empty-handed, and so forth. They are related to the mid, the pre, and the post in the 717. Seven days are as seven years. Then you have the one day for the Feast of Weeks, and you've got the seven days for seven years of booths, Feast of Tabernacles. So what's the answer? Seven, one, seven. It looks like the Lord God's name too, right? Like the Father's name in reverse looks like 717 when you look at it in the, in the Hebrew spelling. So look at what it talks about. This is only used two times, 717, and it means to gather or pluck. Well, we know that the word for gather is the one we're looking at now, right now, and it's the pre-trib one. Well, what else do we know about the pre-trib one? The pre-trib one is the Song of Solomon. Something else we've shared on a number of times. And the one place where the 717 is used for the word gathered <clears throat> is right here in Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1, where the word pluck is in Psalms 80, verse 12. And you might say, okay, well, one says gather, one says pluck. How do you know that gather really is the pre-trib one compared to pluck being the post-trib, I mean, the, the mid-trib? Well, we're going to get to it later, but let me show you an example. In Genesis chapter 8, when you have the stayed seven days, remember seven days is seven years? This, this Genesis 8 verse 10 is the same picture of the seven days as years for unleavened bread. This, this chapter 8 verse 10 is the first seven days as seven years of seals. And when it's over, listen to what happens. The dove is sent out again, and in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. What's this olive leaf? It can also be a branch. And it's what? It's plucked off. You know, the, the, the Greek word <clears throat> for rapture, for harpazo, is plucked. When is it happening? In the seventh year of seals, the great multitude, that the grafted in Gentile church is now that branch is going to be plucked off. We see this in another place we're going to be talking on later that connects to it. In Revelation chapter 12, the, the mid-trib great multitude rapture is in Revelation 12 verse 5, which is the was caught up to pluck. <laughs> so we could see it. Proven in the was caught up in Revelation 12, 5. We can see it in the Hebrew of Genesis chapter 8, verse 10, being plucked when the branch is plucked. And we, of course, have it in the 717, the difference between gather and pluck. And the one that's gather is the Song of Solomon, which is the pre-trib story like Ruth. So what are we looking for? We want to understand more of this plucked, right? We want to be able to understand and dig more into this Ruth story of, uh, sorry, not plucked, of gathering.
okay, this, this gather that's taking place. You're also going to see this a little later in the same connection it, from Ruth chapter 2. It says in verse 10, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? A stranger, okay? Because she's a Gentile. And what does he end up telling her in verse 12? The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wing thou art come to trust. Okay? Then we follow this down. We follow it down. We know she was there still because they got there at the time of the beginning of barley. But she had to stay for how long? Well, in verse 21, it says, and Ruth the Moabitess said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast among my young men until they have ended all my harvest. So what was the end of the harvest for them? Verse 23, the end of Ruth 2. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley and of wheat harvest. Unto the end of the wheat harvest. So she got there at the beginning of the barley harvest, but she's staying until the end of the wheat harvest. And what the vast majority of the world has never gotten is that there are two wheat harvests. This wheat harvest is the Leia, is the older. Just like the story we just saw in Judges 15. She is the older sister, the older one who is his wife, who he says, let me now go into my wife. And it's at the time of the wheat harvest. It is the evidence again that the wheat harvest is a winter wheat harvest. You'll notice that this barley end of wheat, there's no comma. And that means a lot. My, I, I've said the story many times over the years. My wife used to get a kick out of it. Because when it comes to grammar and things like that for me, it's, it's never been my strong suit. But once the scriptures revealed themselves and all of these little details started to, to make sense, it was wild that if you just saw a comma and no and, or if you saw an and with no comma, there, it, there's a reason for it. If there was a comma here, I might be a little bit more suspicious as to what wheat harvest it was. But we have enough evidence in other parts of Scripture that reveals that it is the Feast of Weeks wheat harvest. But the fact that there is no comma here is because these two harvests, they don't harvest at the same time, but they overlap each other. So, of course, the barley harvest starts in spring, in earlier spring, and goes to close to summer, late spring, maybe early summer. Whereas the wheat harvest for the Feast of Weeks, the winter wheat, is harvested closer to the tail end of the barley. It overlaps it. They overlap each other generally by a couple weeks, give or take, maybe more, maybe less. And so they're together. But you see, it, they, they don't have a comma that separates them to say there's this harvest and this harvest and they could be added together. But they're two separate being added like one and two would equal three. This is like one and one, but they overlap. They, they become two together. They don't equal three, okay? And that's what we're seeing here. This is a combination of them being tied together, if you will. And I think the big reason for it is because the barley has nothing to do with prophecy in relation to pre, mid, or post-trib. I've said it before. The barley is already over. The Lord himself fulfilled the, 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 the first fruits of the barley. And those who were resurrected from the dead in Matthew 27, I believe it was 27, they are the ones who fulfilled that resurrection, that, that, that portion, if you will, of the barley portion, okay, of the barley harvest. And I think that's a reason why we're seeing this right here. They're connected together. It's already been fulfilled. Okay? Now it's the portion of the wheat. So let's go see 
a little bit more of where this gather takes us. And remember, let's keep in mind also this one for Stranger. We saw, of course, the weed again with Samson. He wants to go into his wife. We know she is the older because he's offered the younger. Okay? We know it's wheat. So, knowing that it's gather, look what happens now. We come to look up the Hebrew word 622, which is that word for gather. And, of course, we see it in Genesis chapter 29. And where do we see it in chapter 29? Verse 22. A very key place for us to see it. Okay? We're going to talk about more of this here in a moment as well. Uh, the, the earlier part of Genesis 29. But you guys know the story here, right? Again, we see the story of wages. You can go, this word for wages is used four times. It's used, I believe, three times in Genesis uh, 29, uh, and I think 30 or 31. The only other time this word for wages or reward, which remember, we saw, we saw that Ruth, he, he had said that through the Lord God that you would be rewarded, right? That's the fourth time it's used. So again, it's connected to Ruth, and it's connected to Jacob with his wives. Again, Connected to the wheat, connected to the pre-trib, connected, you see, to the time of tribulation. And we see here, of course, in verse 16, Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Just like the story of Samson. Just like the story of winter wheat compared to spring wheat. And we know that he serves seven years for her. He's expecting to get Rachel, but he gets Leah, right? He says those seven years flew by to him like days because of the love that he had for her. And what does he say? It's going to sound just like the story in Samson. In verse 21, And Jacob said unto Laban, because he fulfilled his years, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. See? Give me my wife. I'm come to my wife, that I may go in unto her. Who is she? He's getting the older, just like Samson's wife, the older before the younger. Everybody going pre-trib is called the older, okay? They're the older before the younger. They are the firstborn. That's why they, they're called the first fruits of the feast of weeks of the wheat harvest, okay? They're the feast of weeks, the first fruits of the wheat harvest, because they're the they're like Christ is the Hebrew word 7225. The pre-trib group going are the Hebrew word 1061. Not the same meaning of first fruits, but of first fruits of their portion, which is the wheat. Okay? And you're gonna see what is the first fruits? 10%. The 10% of the Gentile of the uh, of the of the house of Israel of the world that's going first. It's the 10% that goes first, the first fruits of the wheat. You're going to see that tied into the story here tonight as well. So we know the story, and then listen to what happens. In 29, verse 12, uh, sorry, in 20, Genesis 29, verse 22, and Laban, here it is, and Laban gathered together. Hebrew 26, 22. And Laban gathered together. Remember, that's that same word that we're talking about. Remove, take away. It's the same word from Ruth. It's the same word that connects to the 717 of the pre-trib, which is to gather. When does he gather them? Well, let's have a listen. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Huh. He made a feast. What feast did he make? He made a wedding feast, right? It was a wedding feast because we know that he ends up taking Leah, expecting it was Rachel, takes her into the chamber. Oh, sounds like sounds like uh, 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 Judges 15 again, doesn't it, with Samson. He goes into her. He comes out in the morning, and he freaks out because he was beguiled, right? He gets all upset, 
And it's and then in verse 26, it says, and Laban said, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. See, again, the older before the younger. And so he was beguiled with the older before the younger. And what were we told? We all know it. Fulfill her week. This week is, of course, Shabua. It is the word for Feast of Weeks, and it's the first time it's used in Scripture. Lay is the older, the older wheat, the winter wheat. It's at the end of its harvest. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, it's over. It's over. Maybe there's crumbs. Maybe there's corners and gleanings. Maybe there's the gleanings of it taking place like Ruth has to do. So it's a little bit further than we had anticipated. But it has to be the end of the winter wheat harvest. And Ruth is telling us that she's there till the end of the gleaning. She's doing the gleanings after the reapers. Which means it's that little bit of tail end portion, that last little bit coming in that's being picked up and saved. A lot of that's going on around the world, right? A lot of people are expecting it's going to be the, the greatest revival. The, the great revival is about to take place. Well, it is, but not in the sense that everybody thinks. It will not begin until the pre-trib is taken and the 50 days begin. Because we're living in the Laodicean age. You can't have a great revival in the midst of the falling away. You have to wait till the pre-trib happens. Everybody freaks out and there's a panic. And then it'll be the greatest revival in human history. You see? It's so exciting, guys. It's so exciting when we can understand these things. So this, this gleanings that's taking place, I believe that's that portion of time. That's that window of time that we're still in. Because we saw that even on the charts from around the world, and in America specifically, we saw that even to September 14th, last weekend, right, four days ago, was the tail end of the winter wheat harvest. Well, if that's the harvest, there would be gleanings, right? There's still gleanings, of course, machinery nowadays, of course, but we're talking about ancient times and the way it would be done. You'd be end of, at the end of the count, and there'd be some stuff that Ruth is picking up. She's picking up those final little pieces to bring them in. That's what many of you guys are doing. That's what many of us are doing all around the world. People are being brought in, these little bits and pieces coming in here and there. Steve and his team in Uganda are doing that like crazy. But it's not going to be a massive revival yet. It's the gleanings. It's that corners and gleanings picture coming in. And then what do we see? Well, he's telling her, fulfill her week. How does the week start? He gathered them together, and he made a feast. Hold on a second. What feast is he making? We already know what the gathering is. The gathering is the pre-trib. The gathering is at the time of the end of the winter wheat at True Feast of Weeks. It has to be at the end of the gleanings portion within the, win within the wheat harvest, which is winter wheat. We know that it's going to be at the True Feast of Weeks then there will be a seven-day wedding in it, and he makes a feast for those gathered at that time. <laughs> Which one is it? It's pretty straightforward for those that have been here for a bit, right? This is Luke chapter 14. This is clearly crystal clear Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 7. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden. Now remember, for those that hadn't heard this before, there are two prophetic weddings in the end of days. There's the Leah wedding and the Rachel wedding in the typology. But there's the, the, the pre-trib Gentile bride and there's the post-trib Jewish bride. That's why in Luke's gospel, you have a wedding story, a wedding feast. And in, Mar in Matthew's gospel, you have one. In Mark's, you don't have one. And only in Luke's, not in Mark, not in Matthew... Do you also have a banquet after the wedding? We've revealed why there's a banquet after the seven-day wedding that's only found in Luke, not in Mark, not in Matthew. 
and it's because of the remnant workers. So listen to what it says. To those which were bidden, when he marked out how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee, uh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shall thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. So he's saying, when you're called to the wedding, this is a prophetic in uh, 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 a parable saying when you are called to that pre-trib wedding don't go sitting in the highest room when you get there but go and sit in the lowest room as we have shared here so many times right go and sit in the lowest room so look at what's happening there's a bunch of people invited to this wedding pre-trib right what happened with with jacob he gathered them together here they are being gathered, called, bidden together. Then he prepares a meal. It's the wedding banquet. We know it's connected to the Feast of Weeks. And then what do we see? Well, of course, then only in Luke's, we then see a great banquet that comes after the wedding for which we've also done a teaching on. And that wedding, that banquet that comes at the end, is for the remnant workers of those who were part of those to go pre-trib, but were chosen by the Lord to remain who will serve him during the time of seals. Now, what else do we know about this? This same type of wording is what we also found in Luke chapter 9. You guys will remember this. We just did a, a video not too long ago, a teaching on this, um, before the uh what do we call it uh before the transfiguration right so the events that happen in luke before the transfiguration relate to the events of the pre-trib mark it's the events just before the great multitude and in matthew there's nothing because there is no event before bang the lord returns feet down on the mount of olives it's quite powerful so what's one of the places in here that's also very powerful that we've shared on before where is it? It's about when we are invited or when that here, right here. In Luke 9, verse 14, when it says, for they were about 5,000. So this is a picture of those being bidden to the wedding. They were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, make them to sit down in by 50s in a company. And we saw this word sit down. Right. To recline, to sit down, to take place at a table. Right. To sit down at meat. What do we know about this one? It's used three times. And all three times it's used is in the Gospel of Luke, where we are in Luke 9, which is precisely what we were just talking about, that the events in Luke 9 before the transfiguration are all a picture of the events that will take place in the pre before he comes at the end of the seven-day wedding on the eighth day and has a banquet with that remnant. Well, there's that wedding we were just talking about in Luke 14, 8. These two right here, Luke 9, 14 and Luke 14, 8, are both prophetic pictures to the literal pre-trib wedding taking place and the gathering to have that wedding banquet. But we've got another one as well. This one here in Luke 24 verse 30 is the banquet meal that happens after the wedding and this sitting at meat as you guys know from luke chapter 12 when the lord tells them when he returns from the wedding to be ready that when he knocks they will open unto him and he will sit with them and serve them and eat with them that only happens in luke's in luke's gospel chapter 24 and we know it is directly related to what comes next in um, let me go over here in the banquet story that happens in Luke chapter nine, we have 
whoops, in Luke chapter 14, where we had the wedding. So we know the wedding feast comes first. That's the stuff that's all in the above portion. And then we know when the Lord returns on the eighth day, what is he going to do? He's going to be having a banquet meal to them that come and sit at meet with him, which is connected to Luke 24, directly related to this group right here when he returns from the wedding. Look at what he even tells them. In Luke 14, 14, it says, And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. That's because we know these are the ones who put their necks on the line. They're going to be resurrected to rule and reign with them during the millennial reign. These are the ones from Smyrna that take place. There's is the first resurrection. Everybody else isn't going to get to be part of that first resurrection. These are those who will be the little rocks, right? The, the little stones, the little lambs, the little light. They're going to be doing the work of the Lord, serving him during seals, putting their necks on the line. And look at this word for recompense. Right? He's going to repay them. How is the Lord going to repay this remnant group of workers? Well, we know that they're going to take part in the resurrection of the just, which means they're going to take part in the first resurrection to rule and reign with them for a thousand years. But justice belongs to the Lord, right? Well, check this out. How many times do you think, well, you just saw the word is used seven times, okay? How many times do you think it's used in the other Gospels? None. It's only used in Luke 14, verse 14. And what is it about? It's about the Lord talking about the recompense that this specific group in Luke 14, 14 is going to receive at the resurrection. They're going to receive the resurrection to take part as ruling and reigning with Christ as co-heirs. But what is their reward also? That the wrath is the Lord's. Romans 2.19 Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Remember what's happening to these guys? This Luke 14, 14 group? This is the group putting their necks on the line. This is the Elijah company. Those who have been trained up in the understanding and, and brought up in the Lord, diligently seeking and searching him, who he will call out and choose right before the pre-trib happens. And when he comes on the eighth day, he's going to have a banquet meal with these guys. Hence, you just follow the story. And that follows, and in verse 28 of Luke 9, you see the Lord coming at this time of the eighth day. So, what is the other recompense that the Lord's going to do? Well, if these guys are being resurrected at the end of the tribulation, right, at the 14th year, what, what will be part of their reward? The vengeance of the Lord. The Lord who's going to repay the enemies for everything that was done to these guys. It literally says, because it is the vengeance of the Lord and it is his to recompense. Well, do you guys realize when that happens? It happens exactly when we know it's going to happen. Look at this. We see it in Isaiah. Was it Isaiah? Where am I? Uh, yes, Isaiah chapter 61. All right, when we see it right here, remember the Lord in, uh, in Luke chapter 4, in Luke chapter 4, we know it's a post-trib with the return of the Lord feet down, and he's proclaiming the year of the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book. Why did he close the book? We spoke about it recently. The reason he closed the book is because, one, yes, he was declaring a jubilee, but he didn't read the rest of of the verse because prophetically it was not yet time for the vengeance of the Lord God because the vengeance is what the final year of tribulation well who's being resurrected at the final year of tribulation those who put their necks on the line and the Lord said that the vengeance will be his against them 
wild how that works, right? So again, we're only seeing it in Luke's gospel. We're only seeing this in Luke's gospel. There's always a reason. This is why, for those who haven't seen the intro series and begun to understand why there's an importance in the differences within the Gospels, once you understand it, you'll understand why certain things are only in Luke's Gospel. Or they're in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, but they're completely different stories, but they're, they're supposed to be the same storyline, but they're different. When you understand those differences, my goodness, does Scripture ever open up? All right, so it's again, this brings us back to Deuteronomy. The first group that's gathered is the weed harvest. The second group that is plucked is the great multitude rapture that is represented by unleavened bread called the bread of affliction. Tribulation, right? Six days, six years of seals. The Lord returns on the seventh, and the great multitude rapture happens in the seventh year. Okay? Then you have your seven days of tabernacles as your seven years of trumpet judgments. In the seventh year, it's not a time of rest yet. The Lord is going to destroy all of the enemies. You see, this is what we were just talking about. <coughs> the vengeance that belongs to the Lord, the recompense that he is going to bring against all of the enemies of those who came against his remnant workers. He's going to recompense them by bringing vengeance against all of their enemies, and they will take part then in the resurrection of the just. So this is, this is what we're seeing, and it's going to take place in the 14th year. Then he will bring those who were taken into the place in the wilderness at mid-trumpets at the end of the 14th year, which means at the start of the 15th year, which would be the Jubilee, because the last the seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, are the last two sets of seven years in a 49-year count of sevens. When it's over, it's the Jubilee. So when we talk about 14 years, it's the last two sevens, seven and seven of 49, and the 15th year is the Jubilee. <clears throat> well... In tabernacles, what does that represent? It represents the eighth day. The eighth day of tabernacles called, you know, sh I think it's like Shmini Aretz in, in my hacked up English way. So Shmini Aretz is the eighth day and it's called the new beginning. So we know unequivocally the revelation of pre, mid, and post in Deuteronomy and the three feasts of the Lord. We know that it's the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the weed harvest. First fruits, the older before the younger. You see? <clears throat> the firstborn before the younger. It's all connected to the winter wheat harvest. So, let's have a look at this. <coughs> and see what it told us in the book of Jubilees. <laughs> I want you to remember this because I've been beating myself up over this the last couple days. Because this is something that I've gone back and forth on every single time over the last couple of months. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we already knew the answer. But I want to, I'm going to lead you into it by going through this and in the next couple of chapters of things that we're going to talk about that will then lead to why this weekend as what I believe can only be the final option, because as you can see, it must be connected to the end of the winter wheat harvest. But even though it would appear the winter wheat harvest is over, we can now understand that there's corners and gleanings. There's the poor that would go out there and could pick from the gleanings, the stuff that fell and the stuff at the corners that they're to leave for the poor. That's the final tail end of that wheat harvest. So we could conceivably have just that little bit of additional time. But I, I believe it's got to be more than that because that time has to end as well. But could it be just a week? Well, of course it can. But I'm going to show you what else tells us that it could be in, well, 
being the only option left, prayerfully, <laughs> the this one-week difference. Listen to what it says. <clears throat> in the Book of Jubilees, what is this? I don't know what chapter that is. <laughs> is that uh, is that 10? Uh, is that before 50? I don't know, whatever chapter that is. But it's from the Book of Jubilees, and it says, And Israel arose from Haran, from his house, at the new moon of the third month, and came by the well of oath, and offered a sacrifice to God, to the God of his father Isaac, on the seventh of this month. So third month, seventh day. And Jacob remembered the dream, which he had dreamed at Bethel, and he feared to descend to go to Egypt. And while he was thinking that he would send word to Joseph that he should come to him, <laughs> sorry, every time I read that one, I'm like, the, the wording always messes me up the way it's worded. And while he was thinking that he would send word to Joseph that he should come to him and that he would not go down, he remained seven days. Okay, third month, seven days, seven days, that's 14 days. If he might see a vision, whether he should remain or go down. Now listen to this. And he celebrated the harvest festival of first fruits with old grain. Old grain. You get the picture? Winter wheat. Leah, the first before the last, the, the, the firstborn before the younger. Okay, the winter wheat, the old wheat before the spring wheat, the new wheat. The pre-trib is the feast of weeks with the feast, uh, sorry, with the, the first fruits of the wheat harvest for the feast of weeks, which is with the old grain represented as Leah, represented as Samson's wife, represented as Ruth, represented as the Gentile bride. Just as Romans told us i think in chapter eight maybe no in chapter nine which is directly related to hosea chapter one it's everywhere absolutely everywhere and then what do we see and on the 16th day the lord appeared to him so what are we seeing here <coughs> when is the feast of weeks celebrated for the first fruits of the feast of weeks of the old wheat which is the Feast of Weeks, Winter Wheat Harvest. Third month, <clears throat> 15th day. What? Third month, 15th day? Yeah. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Because look at the storyline. And he came by the well of oath, right? This was Jacob's well. So he comes by Jacob's well. and Or sorry. Yeah, he comes by for Jacob's well. Uh, 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 um, and Jacob remembered. Yeah, so this relates to Jacob, the well, all that story that's going on. And we see that again, it's the Feast of Weeks, right? Well, we see the same storyline over and over again, don't we? Remember I said, if we remember back in Genesis 29, what happened? He was at the well, right? At the mouth of a well. And where was he? They, the, the group there through, through Haran. So... Who's Haran? Well, we know the storyline, right? It's the younger, uh, the the younger represented as the Luke group, the mountaineers and so forth, compared to Nahor, which re which means snoring, right? Snoring, which is the Mark group, the sleeping church. So we've talked about all this, but again, we see this this well, and we see a connection to the storyline of Jacob, right? Well, where else do we see this? We see this also. In the story of John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, listen to what it says. And he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. So we're seeing him leave Judea, and he's got to go through the area of Samaria. Well, we're seeing, we're going to see that same storyline in this same context again, where they go by Jacob's well. Again. The well is in the storyline where they are and the season and time is being described again as well. We see, of course, she's the Samaritan woman. They have no dealings with the Jews. 
she the lord appears to her tells her these things about her she says oh my goodness i can't believe it you're right she freaks out over these little things and she talks about i know that the messiah must come which is called the christ when he has come he will tell us all things jesus saith unto her i that speak unto thee am he he literally tells this woman he is christ the messiah right <clears throat> so what are we seeing here in this picture we're seeing the same picture time frame that we're looking at right and um he goes out of the city he then ends up telling his disciples are there yet four months right you're looking for the harvest that comes later because you're looking for the rachel you're looking for the younger you're looking for the spring wheat i'm telling you look at leah look at ruth it's all ready to harvest already okay so we got this story again and again we find it with the connection to jacob's well well here's another one watch this let's go to luke chapter 17. you're going to see a lot of this wording of these things happening again that we've talked about throughout this whole thing let's start uh da -da -da -da, verse 7. <clears throat> Luke 17, verse 7, you're going to see the storyline of the pre and all of tribulation in the storyline. It's wild. But which of you, having a servant plowing, remember, or feeding cattle, remember, whoever puts their hand to the plow and looks back isn't worthy. Remember, when the Lord comes, he's going to be, he has his servants. Okay. Um, but this is before he comes back. This is almost like the pre telling them they're going to be serving, right? Like we talk about when he says uh, when he's going to warn them like Luke chapter 12 before he takes them to the wedding. OK, before the wedding uh, uh, pre-trib is taken, he warns them it's about to happen and to be ready when he returns. OK, listen to what happens here, starting in verse seven. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meet but will not rather say unto him make ready wherewith i may sup and gird thyself and serve him till i have eaten and drunken and afterward thou shalt eat and drink <coughs> excuse me doth he think that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him i throw not right i think not <clears throat> we're seeing this same context of sitting down to meet sitting down and serving the the servants that are going out we're going to be plowing for the lord to be girded about we're seeing the same context but it being shown from from the uh, uh like a negative angle but if it's done from the other one it's the positive angle and we know that over from luke 12 luke 14. so he goes on to say in verse 10 so likewise you when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. <clears throat> See? This, this forewarning, the, this pre-warning of getting ready, guys, that's what we're seeing there in the typology. And then what happens? Well, just so you know, it starts off <clears throat> with him coming through this place as well. You're going to see in verse 11 it says and it came to pass as he went to jerusalem that he passed through the midst of samaria and galilee you're seeing the same context of conversation as we did in john chapter 4 where he was coming from jerusalem right from judea and he's going through and he's got to go through the midst of samaria this same context the same type of conversation again because it's all about the pre all about this group that Luke is speaking to. It says, and he entered into a certain village. There he met him ten men. They were lepers which stood far off. And they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. Okay? They were cleansed. This is like, this is this ten is a picture of a hundred percent of the world of the church okay this is a hundred percent being represented in the ten of those who have come to christ 
at some point in their life. And the Lord has healed them. And the Lord said, okay, <coughs> excuse me, you're mine. I, I believe that you, you've called on my name. Okay, go show yourself to the priest. Boom, you're cleansed. But then what happens? What's the picture we're getting here? Because Luke isn't speaking to Mark's group as well. Luke is speaking to the pre-trip, right? Mark's is the rest. And so what do we see? In verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell on his face. Sound familiar? Isn't that something Ruth did? Fell on her face and why me? Why me, this stranger? Right? Do you remember that? Let's go back to that real quick. Check it out. Ruth chapter 2. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself down to the ground and said unto them, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am but a stranger? Right? Look at what the wording says. <clears throat> the one comes out of the ten, so ten percent, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. <laughs> Connections are so awesome, right? Absolutely awesome. Oh, it's so awesome. This is a picture of Ruth again. That pre-trib bride, that Leah, the, the entirety at the end of the winter wheat harvest. It is the pre-trib bride of Christ. The stranger, the Gentile bride. The 10% of those claiming Christ in the world. There is only 10%. They are what's called what? The first fruits. First fruits. Not the whole field. The first fruits. With the old grain. They are the first fruits, Leah. The first fruits, Ruth. They are the first fruits, lepers, if you will, that have been cleansed. They are 10% of those who are going pre trib. And this is why I've said over the years I believe that the population, that the true population of the world, we only know it's about 8 billion. They'll tell you it's a little over 8 billion. I believe it will be exactly 8 billion at the moment of the pre-trib and when it happens of those 8 billion there will be about 1.5 billion people claiming truly claiming Christ in one way or another and only 10% are going pre-trib i believe it will be about 2% or more like exactly 1.8% 144 million people will vanish and that 1.8% of 10 of, of 8 billion is going to equal the 10% of those claiming Christ on the earth, which would mean that the, the true people claiming Christ, not just faking it around certain people, but truly having claimed the, the name of Christ, that is going to be about 1.44 billion people. Because the 10% will equal, of the church, will equal the 1.8% of everybody going pre-trib of the world. It'll be about or 144 million people. They are the one leper that turned and gave thanks and glory to the Lord and fell on their face praising the Lord and glorified them. That's who they represent. You see, look what happens first, though. A conversation about, you know, hey, when I return and I sup and serve you and so forth, right? And then what do you see? Then you're seeing the 10%. The pre-trib, the first fruits of the wheat harvest going first. The the Samaritan, right? Like like the ones connected to the wells. Like the all of them connected to pre-trib. Like the stranger, the Gentile bride Ruth, who did the same thing, falling on her face. To to Boaz, who is a picture of our kinsman redeemer. What do we know comes after this? What happens after this wedding, right? What happens? This is the pre-trib. Now, this is a picture of that one leper. The pre-trib having happened. 
made whole, gone to the third heaven, right? Having been delivered, made whole and delivered, gone pre-trib. Now the next time the Lord comes, he's coming to start what? Do you see the storyline? He's like revealing himself in the story of Luke chapter 12 that he's coming after the wedding. He's going to sup and serve and to be girded about that they're going to be going out and serving him as their duty. Then you've got the pre-trib like Luke 12 said. He's going to warn them first. Then he's going to go to the wedding and to be ready when he returns from the wedding. There's your pre-trib wedding, your stranger that worshiped the Lord, gave thanks, the 10% first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then when he returns... We know he's coming as the white horse rider. We know he's coming for 40 days as Jonah, as the story of Noah, not the whole story, but as the 40 days of Noah. So listen to what happens next. We come now to verse 20 in Luke 17. Listen to what he says. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Remember, the kingdom of God is everybody pre trib and mid trib. Those going to the third heaven and those going to paradise, they're, they're going to the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God, while on the earth, is inside. It is within, remember? It's the whole story. Of, uh, of the story with that we've shared on of the different temples that have been built. There was the one with, with uh, Moses' time, and it was a portable temple covered in flesh, covered in skins. Well, we are the portable temple covered in skin now. You see? And what, what does Moses' time represent? It represents the time of seals. Because it's still the time of the kingdom of God, which is within. Hello. And then he goes on to say, and he said unto the disciples, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you shall not see it. You see, you're going to desire to see the first of the days of the Son of Man and you shall not see it. Do you know why? Of course you do. It's what we've been talking about here for years. The disciples are remaining. They're not going to take part in the first of the days of the Son of Man. They're not going pre-trib. They're not vanishing to the third heaven. They're remaining here. They're desiring to see it, <laughs> but they're not going to, right? They're not going to take part in it because they're his servants. They're the ones who are serving, who are remaining for the wedding, uh, uh, right? During the wedding, they're going to remain, and then the Lord returns. He has the banquet with them, and we see the rest of the story as we've been talking about. So then listen to what it says. And they shall say to you, see here or see there. Do not go after them, nor follow them. Now listen to this. For as lightning that lighteth out of one part under heaven and shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. Remember, singular. In his day. Well, first of all, it already told us that there was one of several days of the Son of Man. This one is talking about his day. If you've been around for a little bit, you know exactly what this is talking about. This is the Lord post-trib when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, which is what we read about when he comes as lightning from one end unto heaven unto the other in Matthew 24, 27. See, for as the lightning that cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the Son of Man, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This coming is only found in the 24 places it's used, it's only found uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, four or five times, and nowhere else in the Gospels. Hello. It's literally about the return of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And you're seeing the same wording. This wording in Matthew's discourse is not found in Mark and is not found in Luke. Because he's telling them here what it's going to be when he returns in his day, his singular feet down day, okay? So first of all, they're not going to be able to take part in the first one. He's telling them what it's going to be like in his day, but then what does he say? Verse 25, but 
first, which means before I come feet down on the Mount of Olives in my last day, but first, this stuff is going to take place. And what does he say? Verse 25, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days. See, again, from day to now days. It's a different time he's talking about. And again, you've got but first. That makes it clear. Um, in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives and were given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. This is one section right here from verse 25 to 27 of, of chapter 17 of Luke. And it starts with, but first. So what are you seeing here? We see him talking with the servants. We see him talking with the pre-trib, the 10% that goes first. They are exactly a picture of Ruth, of Leah. And then we see him. When does he come next? Well, he's explaining the things that are going to take place. He's explaining when he's going to come in his day. But then he says, but first, which means here's what's coming next after these other events that were up here. I warned you I was going to be coming after the wedding. You're going to serve me. Here's me taking the pre-trib wedding, that Gentile bride, the first fruits. And then he says, but first. So what do we see him coming here as? We see him coming here now as the Son of Man for 40 days. This is the story of now what's taking place. So now the Son of Man is coming for 40 days. He related the story <clears throat> to the story of Noah. Okay? But did he relate the entire story of Noah? No. He only related the story of the flood that they they ate and drank and married until the time the flood came. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's go see what this story tells us in Genesis chapter 7, going into 8. In verse 4, chapter 7, verse 4, for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain 40 days and 40 nights, okay? <clears throat> for yet seven days. And then we see in verse 10, and it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth which means the flood starts on the eighth day seven days and then the eighth day <clears throat> excuse me this seven days in verse 10 and this seven days in verse 4 are describing the first, the same seven days but it's the only seven in the entire story of noah and out of all the other times that are discussed it's the only one that's reiterated twice. One to say, hey, it's, it's about to start. And one to say, here's what's going to happen after it starts. I mean, once the seven are over. Well, it's kind of, it seems silly that they would have that. But we understand what it means. Because there's one that is a typology of seven years. Okay? We know that there are seven years. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're newer, it's like this right here. The, the entire picture of the end of days is seven, 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 and one. But the seven are like the seven years the bride has been getting prepared. The spirit has been waking people up, revealing understanding, preparing the Leahs, the Ruths, preparing that 10% leopard. It's the what we call the seven, quote unquote, easy years. Doesn't mean everything was easy in your life, but easy compared to tribulation. It's the seven years. And before those seven years come to an end, there's the 50 days. Then you've got the next seven and the next seven, okay? So what we're seeing here is a picture of this seven days as seven years. And then what we go down and see in verse 10 is it says, and it came to pass after seven days. Well, what does this seven days represent as after seven days? It's a picture of the pre-trib now having vanished. It's the seven-day wedding that's taking place. <laughs> Remember, we're tying this in even to the storyline of Luke chapter 17. So the, the leopard, the, the wedding is now gone, right? The wedding is taking place. The pre-trib has been taken, is, is taking place. And then what happens? Well, the Lord's returning 
as the white horse rider, as Jonah. He is returning for 40 days as the son of man to warn, as he said he would, as Jonah did. And he's going to do it after the seven-day wedding, which will be after seven days on the eighth day. And in Luke 17, he said it would be as it was in the days of Noah. And what do we see? 717. Funny how that works, right? Funny how that can keep showing up, doesn't it? And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and they prevailed and bare up the ark and so forth, right? There's your 40 days of the flood. The Lord said he would be as the time of Noah where they married and were given in marriage until the flood came and took them all away. Well, there it is. He is giving you the picture here of these 40 days that will begin after the seven-day wedding. And then look at what he says. In Genesis 8, verse 6, And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah had opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sends forth the raven. So at the end of 40 days, that means if the above is 50 days, and there's the seven-day wedding, then you have the 40 days of the Son of Man, means there's three days left. And when the Son of Man leaves at the end of those 40 days, the raven is going to be sent out. After, that's, that's the Antichrist spirit. This is what the Lord, when he's here for 40 days, is warning about. Like he said in Luke 19, he is going to warn them, like he said in Luke 21 in his discourse, that he's going to warn them that Jerusalem is about to be compassed about. It's going to be compassed about by that raven spirit who is going to be Syria. Syria and those with them, this is the attack that comes on Jerusalem 50 days after the pre-trib and this raven this is only the surrounding so this is what 47 days there's only three days left right so syria with their whoever's with them will compass about jerusalem and at the end of 50 days they will destroy jerusalem and jerusalem will flee and that will be the beginning quote unquote the beginning of the end of days the beginning of, I should say, tribulation. Now, obviously, if it what all of these events that happened earlier, when the pre-trib happens, yes, it's definitely the beginning of the end of days. But the, the chaos of war and everything that follows will not happen until Syria starts to surround, but then the dove is sent out. Okay? The dove is sent out. The dove banqueting right the time of wine which means it can go into october even into november for the, the 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 harvest and for allowing some of the fermentation time so we have genesis 8 8 we then see the dove go out what does the dove represent the 50th day right it represents true pentecost pentecost is not the feast of weeks we've explained that and broken it down many times okay so now you're seeing the dove go out and then what happens? Then the dove is gone, right? Listen to what it says. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. And he put forth his hand, and he took her and pulled her unto him into the ark. So the dove is now what? At the end of 50 days, the dove is gone. And when the dove is gone... The 14 years will begin with the raven who represents Ishmael, which represents Syria. The Arabs are going to attack Jerusalem. Okay, we know a first attack will come with Iran and all of them in Haifa and Tel Aviv. This is at the end. This is when the 14 years then begin after the Holy Ghost anointing at true uh, Pentecost, at the Lord God's true Pentecost. And when... Syria attacks when this attack happens We see the dove is now left Which means there's going to be what seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets Here's again seven days as seven years for seals What do we know happens in the seventh year of seals? the olive leaf or branch is Plucked off you see the gather is the pre the plucking is the mid and then what happens? 
Well, then there's another seven days as seven years. And when this seven days is done, the dove is sent out and won't return anymore because it's, he's going to stay here. The tribulation will come to an end. The, four, excuse me, the 14 years, all of tribulation will be over. The, the covering will be taken off and the millennial reign will then begin. Okay? But I, we're going to get back to this in a moment. But I want you to follow this here in relation to the end of the 40 days. We understand where this is. We understand what the Lord is telling us in Luke chapter 17. We see from Luke 11, another place that we've shared on this many times, that in Luke 11 and the one in Mark and the one in Matthew, the story of Jonah are all different. And it's something that has caused people over the years to stumble as to these differences in the discord in the Gospels. And they think, well, because of these differences, there's there's a, a discrepancy and the Bible n must not be true, but written by men. Well, guess what? We've proven what they mean. And we're not going to go in the other two. Mark has no warning. That's on purpose. We know it. And Matthews has something else. But the one in Luke is the one we're talking about because Jesus said he would be as Jonah was. So what was he? It said, for as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation, the final generation. He is coming as Jonah to warn at the time when the typology of the flood of Noah for 40 days represents his coming for those 40 days, which will take place over all of the earth in the chaos of what happened in the pre-trip. It's going to be chaos with 144 million people vanishing. And he's going to come and warn for 40 days as he did with Jonah. And so this is what we were talking about here a moment ago. So when the 40 days are over, the raven spirit, the raven, which means in the, in the Hebrew is from the word uh, uh, Arab. And we know Arab is the word going to Ishmael. You see? And Ishmael is connected to the beginning of the 14 years. For those that hadn't seen this before, if you go into Genesis chapter 16 and you see Sarah and Hagar with, um, with Abraham and he has his first child, which he wasn't supposed to have, he ends up having Ishmael. And she says, because you have heard my affliction. Okay, Ishmael, affliction. And it says, he will be a wild man. And his hand will be against every man and every man's hand against his. This is what's going on in the Middle East all the time. They will never be at peace until it's over. He's a wild man. And what happened? Abraham was 86 years old when he was born. Chapter 17, 13 years later, Abraham is 99 years old. When God makes a covenant, remember what we said, the Lord's coming to, at the start of the 14th year. He's going to take vengeance on everybody and renew his covenant. And what is it? 99 years, 13 years later, God makes a covenant with, with Abraham and his household. And we see that Ishmael is now 13 years old. And then what happens? Then you go to chapter 21. Abraham is now 100 years old. Hello, Abraham's now 100 years old and Isaac, the prophetic picture of Christ, is born. You see, Ishmael is a picture of the raven, the Arab. He is the lineage of the Arabs. He is the one who's going to compass about Jerusalem with his proxies or whoever else and will destroy it at the end of 50 days. But at the end of 47 the compassing about will start. <clears throat> and then the dove is released. The dove goes out at the end of the 50th day. And this is important to understand because you're going to see what takes place here. Watch this. In Genesis, in, in Genesis chapter 8, the dove is the 50th day. At the end of the 50th day, what happens? The dove's gone. Right? 
The dove is gone. The dove, the, the dove, the, is, which is a picture of the Holy Ghost, right? Dove is the representation of peace. The dove is now going to leave having anointed that remnant group of workers, having anointed them with what we call Acts 2.0. And then the dove is gone. Once the dove leaves, this remnant group of workers, having been anointed by the dove, by the Holy Ghost, will go out from Jerusalem, exactly as we read in Luke chapter 24, which is only found in Luke 24. And when the dove, when they go out from Jerusalem, Jerusalem is then attacked and destroyed. And the Jews will be removed from the land for the next seven years. You see, it must take its rest. This is what, the, this is what all of church has missed, that the land must be destroyed. Because of their disobedience, it has to take its rest for the next seven years before the Lord can build the temple on it. There will be a remnant brought back and will build the foundation, but that's all that's going to get built in the midst of seals. It won't be till after the seven years and the first and the, the eighth year, which is the start of trumpets of trumpet judgments, the seven years of trumpets, that will be the beginning of the rebuilding of the physical temple. So look what happens. The dove has come. The Holy Ghost. Peace is now removed. And then what happens? Well, the 14 years begin. Days as years. And look at this. Many of you guys know this story. Verse 10 says, and he stayed yet seven other days. Verse 12 says, and he stayed yet seven other days. The second one, which is the beginning of trumpets, the seven days as years for trumpets, it means to wait, to be patient, to tarry. Well, that's normal. That's what you would think the word stayed means. Stayed, waited, hung out a little bit, right? But look at what the beginning of the 14 years starts with. When the dove is gone, we know that Jerusalem is attacked. It begins World War III at exactly what we keep saying is the time of the red horse rider. Because Messiah, the son of man, is the white horse rider. So look at what it says. Genesis 8.10. If you didn't have a, a strong concordance like this at your fingertips, you would read stayed, and you would read stayed, and you would think nothing of it. But look at the definition for the beginning of the 14 years. The word stayed means to wreathe in pain. Be in pain. Be much pained. Travail with pain. The predominant word in here, which I have had highlighted for years, just jumped out on me this afternoon. Pain, pain, pained, pain. The number one word, the most descriptive word used to describe the beginning of the 14 years is the word pain. For those of you who have been following around for a little bit, you know where I'm going, don't you? Revelation chapter 12. I told you there was a little tidbit of, of additional info tonight outside of maybe other little things you got here and there. This is it. Remember what I kept saying? We've been showing this for years. Revelation 12, 2. <clears throat> it says, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth. This travailing is the representation, the prophetic picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man as Jonah, as, as warning, as the 40 days of Noah. It is the 40 days travailing picture that we've shared from Isaiah chapter 66, verse 7. This travailing is the 40 days of the Son of Man. The pre-trib bride is already gone. This is during the seven days. And the word for travailing is the Son of Man's 40 days. What have we been talking about here for years? What begins the 14 years? The red horse rider begins the 14 years. And the red horse rider is the beginning of what? The official quote-unquote tribulation. Of course, it will have already officially started with the pre-trib and, and the, the attack in northern Israel and Haifa and Tel Aviv and, and, and the Son of Man being here for 40 days. You know, of course, it will have already started the tribulation. But the actual breaking out of pain 
Hello. How many times have you heard me say over the years, this word right here, this word pained right here, represents the beginning of the 14 years and is a picture of the start of World War III with the attack on Jerusalem and then World War III breaking out. This word right here, pained, represents the first two and a half years of tribulation, which is going to be World War III for about two and a half years, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, people against people, neighbor against neighbor, is all in this word pained. And I just realized today, this afternoon, that that word for uh, for tarry or wait in Genesis chapter 8, verse 10, though we've known it, that it rep represents tribulation, it had never dawned on me <clears throat> that the main focus of that meaning is pain. There's another one. Is pain, 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 pain. Why? Because here's our confirmation proving it out. Revelation chapter 12, 2. The travailing in birth is the 40 days of the Son of Man. Then we know the, com the, the, the compassing about of the raven. Then we have the dove. And when the dove leaves, the 14 years begins at the red horse rider, which is when peace is removed and a great sword is given and the pained begins with neighbor against neighbor, kingdom against kingdom, people against people. Here it is right here. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 6. We've got a video. Just go back and look at the White Horse Rider video. A few, uh, a few videos back. You can't miss it. And you will understand the White Horse Rider is the Son of Man. The only issue is the world doesn't understand that the Son of Man is coming for 40 days first. They are not prepared for it. They have no idea that he's coming first. They think the Lord doesn't return again till feet down on the Mount of Olives. Oh, my goodness, have they missed a lot in understanding. But that's okay. It just hasn't been revealed to them. We are a people being prepared. The white horse rider is the Son of Man. And now listen to the red horse rider. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard a voice. Sorry, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him to take peace. Peace is a representation of the dove, of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and when was peace removed in Genesis chapter 8? You see, not only after the seven days, the 40 days, then there was the raven that represents the three days. Peace, which is the dove, represents the Pentecost, the new wine. Once that's taken, <clears throat> then what happens? Then pain. Then what? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And what does it say? Then peace was taken from the earth that they should kill one another. See? Kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword so that they can what? Kill one another. That's why when we've gone to 2nd Ezra so many times, it says exactly the same thing. Here's the pre-trip. The Most High will deliver those who are upon the earth, and bewilderment of mine shall come over those who dwell on the earth, and they shall plan. Why plan? Because it's going to be 50 days before the attack happens on Jerusalem, and it becomes nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So look what it says. And they shall plan to make war against one another. City against city, place against place, people against people, kingdom against kingdom. It's the same story. It's the time of the red horse rider that they should kill one another. It's showing you the story right there. We know that the pain is the beginning of the 14 years, and it starts with two and a half years of World War III, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, at the red horse rider. We even see it in Zechariah chapter 8. Another famous one we've gone to many times over the years. Remember, Zechariah chapter 8, if you're newer, has 14 chapters. 
It's a prophetic picture within it of the end of days. Chapter 8 would be what? The beginning of the seven years of trumpet judgments. We know at this point in Zechariah chapter 8 that the Lord has returned on Mount Zion. He's returned with paradise. That's why he, it's the holy mountain of the Lord, the city of truth. Okay? He's no longer jealous. He's there on heavenly Mount Zion. And listen to what he tells them. Now they're about to rebuild the temple on the foundation that was laid during seals because the temple, the city streets and temple are going to get rebuilt in the first half of trumpets by the Lord with his modern days of Rubabel. And listen to what it says in verse 10. For before these days, there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast. Neither was there any hello. Peace. Peace. To him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, everyone, against his neighbor. That's the red horse rider. So when we come to Luke 17, <clears throat> and we're seeing this wording, that this is when he's coming feet down. And he says, but first, he is telling you the 40 days of the Son of Man that are coming first. And then he's going to tell you the, the events of neighbor against neighbor, kingdom against kingdom. And he goes on to tell you in verse 27, uh, verse 28, he also then says, likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot. Now you're getting another picture. As the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold. This buying and selling is the same definition for Revelation chapter 13, that people won't be able to buy and sell except they have the mark. Because this is the group going through seals, going through the tribulation. It's, it's everywhere. It's telling us everywhere, guys. Now, look what happens. In Luke's discourse, we saw the but first of Luke 17, 25. And in Luke 21, this is mainly for, your, for you newer people. In 21, you have black letter words, verse 10, that say, Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's the red horse rider, right? And there's going to be earthquakes, famines, fearful sights, great signs. And look at what verse 12 says. But before all these. What do you think it means from the but before all these with the but first that we just showed you and what it all connects to in relation to the white horse rider when Christ said he's going to come and warn, as he said he would as Jonah, that Jerusalem is going to be compassed about, and here he is warning that Jerusalem is about to be compassed about. You see? And as the days of vengeance, that all things which are written might be fulfilled. And it'll go on until the time of the Gentiles is over, is fulfilled, which is the end of seals. That is his warning. So what doesn't take place in this time? In Luke's discourse, it means these things that are taking place are the events at some point within the 50, which represents the pre-trib, right, in Luke 21, 36. Watch ye therefore always, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Right, all these things are going to come across, come upon the whole world being caught off guard, just like it said with, when the flood came, it covered the whole earth. The escape is going to affect the whole earth, obviously. Almost 2% of the population vanishing. But it's not going to be Red Horse Rider during that time yet and in Luke's discourse. But what happens when you get to Mark's discourse? You guessed it. You've been here for a while. You already know it very well. Look what happens. Luke's discourse starts right off in verse 8. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in diverse places. And there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. This right here, this verse right here, Mark chapter eight, uh, ver Mark chapter thirteen, verse eight. This verse right here is the equivalent to the word pained. That's going to last two and a half years of World War Three and earthquakes, and famines, and troubles, and sorrows. These are the beginnings of sorrows. This is only the, this represents the first two and a half years 
of tribulation. The red horse rider, the pain, the war, nation against nation, and all this chaos. And it all begins with the attack on Jerusalem that the Lord was warning about that's going to come after the compassing about the anointing of Acts 2.0 and then the attack. And that starts the 14 years at the word pained. So brothers and sisters, there are 50 days that come before the official 14 years kick off. Seems pretty crazy, doesn't it? Because how on earth can we get a count of 50 days equaling anything that goes into November for 50 days? Well, we know what the answer is now, don't we? It's because the Hebrew calendar is wrong. We know the calendars are off. We've proven it now. It's not even a kind of or, or a sort of or, or maybe kind of but possibly. No. What were we able to show that happens this year in 2024 and doesn't happen again for another 30 years? We were able to show that Savan, which is the celestial uh, uh, constellation of Taurus, right here at the summer solstice, was a full moon in Taurus. That is the picture I believe the Holy Ghost has been trying to get us to. This understanding, well, and much more, in the revelation that in all of these seven years, in all the revelations we've had, the Holy Ghost only gave us one, one literal in the physical confirmation of 50 and right on target. Right on target revealed to us Taurus, the bullseye. It represents the beginning. It's the 14th brightest star in the sky, and it represents the number 50. It represents the name noon for perpetuity. The Lord is the beginning and the end. In the beginning of Genesis, he is the Aleph. He is the beginning. <clears throat> he is the beginning. Well, we've shown that the beginning was what? The beginning used to be in spring at the equinox in Taurus. Now, the equinox, Taurus, is now solstice in this year, 2024. And if it's to be as it was in the beginning, what happened? Well, God made two great lights. One to rule the day, one to rule the night. When he created them, they were both bright. So in the beginning, Taurus, in the constellation of Taurus, he is the Aleph, right? The Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav, right? He is the Ox, right? The, the Taurus and the Cross. So in Taurus, at the sun and the moon, together as they were at creation, bright, in 2024, that won't happen again for another 30 years, was right there on the solstice. An exact count of being off from where it should have been in the equinox as it was in the beginning. So what did we do? We then know, and how did we know this? What ended up happening? The moon in June of this year was where it was supposed to be. It sounds crazy, right? But we, we have the understanding of it in the book i think it's the book of jubilees right let me bring this up again watch this <clears throat> uh da, 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 da. right the 10 days they will notice that the moon has corrupted its stated times so in jubilees in the book of jubilees it says and there will be those who will make observations of the moon for this one the moon corrupts the stated times and comes out too early each year by 10 days. We know in the Gregorian, we know that the total now is 11 and a quarter days. What did it say it does? It corrupts the stated times. It corrupts the stated times because it has fallen. But in the count we've been revealed, we showed that the count to this year 
And uh, as I've said before, I can count any year backward, any year forward, and tell you where the moon should be. Not in its stated times where they're trying to tell us, but where it should be, but isn't. And that's what's always so hard for people to understand. It's like saying, well, look, we just saw the full moon last night. It was the full moon harvest moon. I mean, you can't tell me it wasn't there. It was a big, bright harvest moon. I get it. But we know that even though it's there, it's a corrupted position that it's in. It's not where it's supposed to be. But in the revelation of the count, in 2024, one time every 30 years, the full moon at the equinox, or in this case solstice, in Taurus, happened together at the time they were supposed to. And it's, I'm not saying this because it was the full moon here. I'm saying this because I did a count from 2015. And I did the count and count and counted it and saw when they didn't add a, a month for two years and three years and counted how much the moon was out because of it and continued forward. And I went 30 years and saw that this doesn't happen again for another 30 years. It's not because it was the full moon. It's because it was supposed to be the full moon here and it was in its proper place, even in its corrupted time. This one place right here, this time, is where it's supposed to be. Well, guess what that means, brothers and sisters? That means that Virgo, which the sun entered Virgo on the 16th. Well, we know the importance <clears throat> and the necessity of Virgo. Because Revelation 12.1 is a representation of Virgo. So if the Son of Man <clears throat> is coming as the travailing, then that means we must be at a time where Virgo is in the sky, where the Sun is in Virgo. And this year, the Sun is in Virgo, probably every year, on September 16th. But remember, what are we looking for? We are looking for the true Feast of Weeks to the Lord God. The true Feast of Weeks, everybody thinks, is over here. They think this is the time frame of the Feast of Weeks. I keep going to the 8th, remember? And then saying to the 9th begins the 50 days. Remember when we did that with August? We were looking to the 12th. And then to the 13th would begin the 50 days. And then I said, oh, my goodness, we understood it already. It's already there, even in the Apocrypha. We're looking for the 15th day. And the 16th begins the 50 days. But then what happened? We went a little bit further. and We were like, no, the 8th again. No, 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 wait a second. It's got to be the 15th. I'm not making up the 15th. We have the 15th being told to us. Right? This is what we were talking about. From the well of oath, when did he celebrate the feast of weeks of the first fruits with the old grain? On the 15th day of the third month. So it's the 15th day of the third month, but the world will try to tell us that it's right here. But we know the sun has gone off course, and what this is, is supposed to be, is supposed to be, back here so if it's off and we know that that's where it's supposed to be then what did we talk about then we know that where this is should actually be down here right this is why we were looking forward over the last couple days yesterday and into today we were looking forward as maybe the other potential right we were just looking at what we were just looking last week from here to here, right? This would be the end of the 50, and this would be, uh, sorry, the end of the uh, uh, the Feast of Weeks, the, the end, and this would be the beginning of the 50 days. I did the same thing I did back in August, right here, and then saying, wait a second, we know it's right here. So why was I looking from the 11th to the 12th? 
or the eighth of Elul to the ninth of Elul. We shouldn't be looking to that. So then what do we do? Well, if we know the sun is off, I mean, and we know the moon is off, and we go from June, then we have July, August, September. I have proven that the moon is off course, and I could show where it's supposed to be, and I could always be within about a one-day difference because there's quarter days sometimes. So we know that it's about three days off. So what was I saying? Well, maybe we go three more days, right? We'd go three more days. So there's your one, two, three. So this would be our escape time. And it would be here we were connected to an eighth to the ninth and then realizing, oh, no, wait a second. We need to add three days for the month being off. Maybe that's a possibility. Remember I was talking about that? Because I kept talking about wanting to delete this video, saying, forget it, I've had enough. And then it coming back to me and then forgetting it again and saying, oh, screw it, I'm going to delete it. I've had enough. <laughs> well, here I was again thinking, man, I should probably just delete the last five videos. You see, it's an emotional roller coaster doing what we do. And through the revelation and in all of this and really truly understanding this this time and the end of the fifth, the end of 70 years and all of this, we ugh, it's not just a regular ministry. We're not just any group being prepared. It's for real. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ that we've been given. We are a group of people being prepared. And we're dogs on bones. We're relentless because we know what we have understood. And, you know, just we I, I keep getting too ahead of myself. And hopefully, prayerfully, we finally understood it. That if this is here and we know that the reality of it isn't the 15th, you see, why was this here? Because the moon was in its proper place. So we had the sun at its time, the moon full at its time, like in creation, in Taurus, as it was in the beginning, Aleph. First time, won't happen again for another 30 years. But because it was the 15th, and I'm looking at it and going to the 8th and the 15th, the 8th to the 15th, ah, there it is. No. Why was I looking to the 15th? Because it was the 15th here. But this is where the moon was in its proper place. To account, as Jubilee said, as we know how to do, that it's in its wrong place, except right here, we account for one, two, three months. Three months means the moon is going to be off about three days. Which means even though <clears throat> the full moon was here, where it's supposed to be is off by one, two, three days. So if it's off by three days, we should be looking this weekend, the 21st into the 22nd. Well, guess what? Of course we should. In all of this, that's been the entire storyline. Of course we should be looking to these two. We have to account for the moon being off. We have to be in Taurus, uh, sorry, account from Taurus that brings us to a year's end that's connected to a bridal chamber and a wedding that has to be in Virgo for the events to begin to take place so that when the Son of Man comes after the seven days on the eighth day, he's coming in a time when we are still in Virgo exactly as the revelation has revealed. Check, 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 check. You see this? That makes this right here. You see that? What's the difference between them? Three days. Because we had to account for the moon. Well, of course we needed to account for the moon. Because the 21st into the 22nd is what? It's the picture of where this is. But this is properly in its place, but it should be what? It should be the spring equinox, right? Which means it's now the summer solstice because the sun being off and now the moon being accounted for. This should be the summer solstice, but now 
It's the fall equinox, and we had to account for the moon. For those who have been following the last several videos, if you've been around for a while, you, you should be able to grasp at this point what I'm talking about. We have been given the revelation. We can prove through Scripture the accounting of all of these things and in relation to the pre-trib, the layer, the root, the timing. We know it. We know now even a little bit more that it goes to the gleanings of the wheat, of the winter wheat harvest. The older, the layer, the stranger, the 10% first fruits of the wheat harvest. We know it. We know that this is the end of 70 years. We've been led in this for seven years trying to track down the understanding of the 70th year. I believe one of the only ministries, if not the only ministry doing it. Because we have been Holy Spirit led to persistently stay on it. Because it is the revelation of the end of days. There is 50 days before the 70 years are over. I just showed it to you again in the story with, 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 with uh, Noah. It is an absolute 50 days. The above is 50 days before the red horse rider 14 years begins. We know it has to be in Virgo. Yet it has to be the very end, the tail end. You could probably even say the, the gleanings of the wheat harvest. But we also have to have a connection to the circuit of the sun. The, a, a bridal chamber. And we have it. In a year when it only happens once every 30 years. We've understood it, guys. I do believe this is it. And you know what's really scary? This is what makes it so nerve-wracking. This is what makes it so, so like coming out of our skins on some of this stuff. You know, this is why I try to distract myself. I'll, I'll go out and grab a, a lunch or a coffee throughout the day because I'm always at home, work from home, <clears throat> dealing with emails and comments and posts and, you know, talking to people. And I love doing this stuff. I'll never change. But I need mental turn off time and, and go out for a drive doing something. Because it is hard to, one, accept that this is really happening. And, and is it possible that we've really understood all of this? And while we're in that state of, of processing it, we're also in the state of saying, but what if it isn't? But what if it isn't? Here we are, a ministry that has been spirit-led through the revelation. No audibles. No, no visions. No dreams. None of that. All through the leading of the spirit, the revelation of the scriptures have opened up. I just, I read them. And I just knew where they connected. And I hadn't even read my, my King James before. A few verses here and there. It just, boom, it all came into order. I can't explain it. But the, but the, but the proof of it is the seven years of the teachings. It is the evidence of what has been taking place. And in that evidence, there is a beginning to this and there is an end. And if we are taking part in bringing in and preparing at this time of the beginning, then I believe the cherry on top should be an understanding of the beginning. Does it sound convoluted? Does it sound twisted? Of course it does, man. You got to figure this out to the Feast of Weeks and even into September. But then on top of that, you got to understand how to, under, how to discern, discern that the moon is off. But guess what? We had the revelation of it in Jubilees. The book of Jubilees told us that the moon would, would deceive us of the times where it appears to be because it shouldn't actually be there coming out too early. But you know what the scriptures never told us? You know what the apocryphas never told us? They never showed us about the sun. And guess what? The one thing the Holy Ghost confirms to us is the revelation of Taurus that brings us to the beginning, that revealed to us in the beginning that's where the sun was. The one thing we couldn't have ever discerned from Scripture or from the Apocryphas 
was the one thing in a thousand teachings over seven years was the one thing out of all of the teachings that was so important that the Father instructed the Holy Ghost to inform Jodell to fulfill my prayer and she didn't even know it. Nobody on earth had a clue. That will stay with me for eternity. How powerful it was and how it revealed Taurus. And that's not even saying everything else it revealed within Taurus, which we've talked about. The pendant that Jesus was wearing that's on the Shroud of Turin, that's that's the Ayin Aleph Nun, right? It's 16, 1, uh, uh, 14. It, it, it's, it, it's Taurus. Jesus is wearing a pendant that is the picture of the head of Taurus with the eyes, Taurus, the right eye, the uh, Taurus, and the left eye. And we were led, the Spirit led us to Taurus. And that that left eye is the one that represents noon, the 14th brightest star in the sky. And noon is the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And numerically, it represents 50. And we're talking about 50 days, 14 years, and the 50th Jubilee. And that's the end time code. What? Do you understand why as, as seemingly twisted it sounds to be going this far to understand the Feast of Weeks? To understand this count of, of the moon and really, is that really how it's off? But we have Apocrypha that confirms it. And I'm able to show it. And then the one thing we didn't have is the whole is, is, is the understanding of, of the sun and we couldn't get it from the Apocryphas or from the scriptures. And so the Holy Ghost lets us know that that's what it was in the beginning. That's why Jesus is called the Aleph and the Tav. He's called Taurus and the Cross. Because in the beginning, it all started in Taurus. And we went and dug into it. And what did we find out? That the spring equinox used to be Taurus. Which means where Taurus is this year, as we just covered, is where Virgo should be. Hello. Which means if it's all pushed back, then that means... We need to look for this place where it would be in Virgo, equivalent to the solstice, which would then be the equinox. Not the 15th on the Hebrew calendar. Because they're off because they fall behind by about a month, uh, a, a day every month. And in proving it, look what happens. Exactly three days in between. None of this is made up. Every single part and portion and piece of all of this that I've shared is trackable, traceable, countable, historical record in the scriptures, in the apocryphas, and taking place in the sun, moon, and stars. Every single part and piece of this, you guys can go and track for yourselves. And don't forget, we do have scripture that told us the sun and moon would be ashamed, remember? <clears throat> Isaiah 24, 23. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. Why on earth, <clears throat> excuse me, would the sun and moon be ashamed at the presence of the Lord reigning from Mount Zion? Because they have fallen and gone off course. Brothers and sisters, this is what we're talking about here. September 21st into the 22nd. Could we maybe say, oh, do you want to say maybe into the 23rd? Yeah, maybe we can hold out till then. But this is one, two, three days. Then you have what? Then you have exactly what this would be right here. Which would be what? Third month, 15th day, is the equivalent 
of where it is now in Virgo at the fall equinox. The first fruits with old grain. And do you think it's a coincidence that the end of the winter wheat harvest literally came to an end, <clears throat> according to U.S. statistics? Last Saturday, the 14th of September, and we come to see Ruth, who was involved till the very end of the wheat harvest. And in it, what was she doing? Gleanings. Corners and gleanings represent the very end of it. So once again, I'm going to say, this is where I believe, I believe, I am prayerful, I am hopeful, I am encouraging and strengthening and doing what I can to take us through to this final piece. And what do I do if it's not? I don't know. I will still teach. We will still put together the revelations. We will go deeper into the revelations. We will go out and reach more people. I can do I can do uh, Zoom uh, meetings with people, Zoom Bible studies that people would like me like to have me join to help teach the the people that they have in their in their in their Bible studies at home or wherever they might be. Uh, might hit the road. We'll we'll reset all of these videos and do focused teachings with specific names and categories. I've got a bit of a plan of what will take place, but. Do I think we'll need to, as Neil said? Nope. Do I think we're going to have to be like Mark said, and uh, 70 years means not years of them in the land, but maybe it means 70 camels? You know, 70 goats, uh, 70 rocks, uh, 70 what? I don't know. Nope. I believe like they say, like we say, like I agree, we're here. And now that we realized in the last couple of weeks, we were reminded that we needed Virgo. It now makes complete sense. So with that, brothers and sisters, I pray it blesses you. I pray it strengthens you. I pray you will remember to, you know, if you can support, if you can pray, we are going to still be sending till the final moment, whatever we can to, uh, to Steve and the team out there in Uganda. They are doing a great job. I love you guys. I appreciate it. If you can't support, don't worry about it. If you're not going to, it's okay. Just please continue to pray for each other. Continue to lift each other up. Continue to watch, pray, diligently seek and search. Because the time is near at hand. And those who are watching and praying will be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. God bless you. God bless your families. Bye for now.